I'm a little bit of a medical history geek, and if you'll bear with me for just a couple of minutes, I'm going to remind us all of where we have been so that we appreciate the direction that we are going in. And it also lends a little humility because some of the things that we laugh about now that people were doing 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, so our grandchildren if they are in medicine, are going to be laughing at us for the things that we are talking about right now that seem very cutting edge to us. So this was um, JAMA 1974. This was a publication that was an update to the resuscitation guidelines that had just been put out and sort of decided upon the preceding year in 1973 by the AHA and the National Academy of Sciences. So they got together created an update to the resuscitation guidelines, put it in JAMA. And the front cover of JAMA in 1974 for this particular issue was sort of a historical reference of what resuscitation had looked like previously. And it was kind of funny when you take a look at some of the pictures here, right? So you can see there's, there's in the upper right-hand corner, so there's like let me beat this patient into back into sinus rhythm, right? I'm going to resuscitate you by beating you. There's fumigation. Um, if you look at that middle left photo there, so the, a bellow is being used to try to ventilate the patient. So the original BVM, the OG BVM, was a bellow that they were using to inflate the lungs. Um, rolling patients over a barrel. So that was CPR back then. Um, so some really interesting methods here until we finally got to kind of what we know now as effective CPR, and we've got our rates down, and we've got, you know, how deep the chest compressions need to be. But you can see it took a while for us to get to this point. And electricity is no different. So it took time for us to figure out that, oh, maybe we can use electricity to restore normal rhythm in a patient who's got a dysrhythmia. So in the prior to the 1940s, there had been animal studies looking at the use of electricity in terms of restoring sinus rhythm for animals that were in V-fib. So they would induce V-fib in animals and then use a higher voltage to then defibrillate them and get them back into sinus rhythm. In the 1940s, um, 1947, there was a 14-year-old that was having open-heart surgery for a congenital uh, cardiac defect. So he had pectus excavatum. And he was, they were, towards the end of that surgery, he went into ventricular fibrillation. And the CT surgeon at the time, who knew the studies that had been done in animals previously, you know, had started cardiac massage. So that was, you know, internal CPR, internal chest compression, starts cardiac massage unsuccessful. And so he's like, hey, what if we use some internal electrodes and hook it up to this 14-year-old's heart and see if we can restore sinus rhythm again? And it worked. Okay, so that's 1947 internal electrodes. Fast forward about a decade, and Paul Zoll is a Harvard cardiologist who is like, hey, that's pretty cool that we can do that on the inside, but what if you have a patient that's in ventricular fibrillation? Can we defibrillate them from the outside? And so you can see that now to us, we're like, well, duh, like, why didn't they think of that sooner? But these are all the little micro steps that it takes to get to the next innovation. And so then he publishes a case series of patients that he is able to defibrillate externally, which at the time was a huge lift from a technological standpoint. Unfortunately, only one patient survived of his case series, um, but set the stage for trying to figure out how can we do this for patients in VFib and externally defibrillate them successfully. Finally figured out the correct voltage, finally got the technology together, and then you fast forward 1994, not that long ago. 1994 is the first case series published in Jack of dual sequential external defibrillation. Okay, so this is not as new as we think it is, but a lot of the studies are now coming through. So it's taken time for us to kind of figure this out properly. So case series, five patients that were in refractory V-fib that they then, after multiple uh, defibrillation attempts, successfully were able to resuscitate and got all five of them back into normal sinus rhythm with dual sequential external defibrillation. 
And now the excitement begins, right? How can we now standardize this? How often should we be defibrillating the standard way before we switch to this? Fast forward 30 years to the dose VF trial. And so this came out in 2022, very, very exciting from the pilot study all the way to the uh, official publication that came out with all of the data. And what were we looking at here? So this was looking at standard defibrillation, anterolateral pad placement, vector change, anter posterior uh, pad placement, and then all four pads all together. So fire the anterolateral, fire the anteroposterior sequentially. And what does that look like in terms of outcomes? I like to show this picture. So I asked my coworkers to, hey, I need a photo of what all these pads look like. I want you to put it on, take a photo of one of you guys. And I, this is my coworker, so I hit his face so nobody would know who it is. But I just want you to see how much real estate this takes, right, to put these four pads on the patient. And so they sent me this photo and I'm like, you guys did it wrong, but OK, thanks. I'm still going to use the photo. And so they flipped two of the pads. Two of the pads are in the wrong spot. But you can see it takes a lot of real estate on a patient's chest. And this is this is a pretty big guy. But, you know, and he's like robust. He's tall. But in a smaller, you know, 50 kilo woman, this might be kind of challenging. It's a lot of real estate. And so what was Dose VF looking at? It was looking at primary outcome survival to discharge, okay? How many of these patients are actually surviving to discharge? The secondary outcomes are almost more interesting, right? So VFib termination rates, return of uh, spontaneous circulation, and then discharge with good neurologic outcome. And that's really the big one. That's what we care about. How many of these patients are leaving the hospital with good neurologic outcomes? And they were measuring that with a modified Rankin scale of less than or equal to two. And what we found was it looks like things trend towards dual sequential external defibrillation. So standard defibrillation kind of performed the poorest, followed by vector change, followed by dual sequential external defibrillation. Now, this is relatively small study. So you're talking about 400 patients that were enrolled in the study, and they had to actually terminate the study early because there was a paramedic shortage, and so it was difficult for them to actually be able to continue enrolling patients into the study and to be able to, to really adhere to the three arms appropriately. Interestingly, the one thing that always comes out of dual sequential external defibrillation that everyone always harps on and is so worried about is damage to the defibrillator. And there was not a single reported case of defibrillator damage in this particular study. So the key here is that you don't want the pads to touch. So make sure that the pads are not touching one another. They should be close to each other, but not touching. And then ideally, you want to use the same model defibrillator. So if you're using whatever manufacturer you're using, use the same manufacturer for your second defibrillator. Now, the next question that kind of dose VF has now given birth to multiple other studies that have come out since then. So the next question came, what is the optimal time between the shocks? So how long should we be waiting between that first shock and the second shock? We say double sequential or dual sequential, but what does that actually mean in terms of timing? And so the dose VF investigators went back retrospectively and looked at the data and they looked to see what was the time difference between that first and second shock? And that data was all in the defibrillators. And then what did that look like in terms of outcomes? So which patients did the best? How much time can we let pass between these shocks before we see perhaps poor outcomes? And what they found was an interval of less than 75 milliseconds. That's almost simultaneous, right? Less than 75 milliseconds was associated with higher rates of VFib termination and higher rates of ROSC. So it's literally boom, boom. It's as fast as you can get it. You're going to want to do that sequential defibrillation. And the longer that interval went, the worse the outcomes were. Unfortunately, though, no matter how fast you are, there was no difference in terms of survival or survival with good neurologic outcomes, regardless of how short that interval was between those two defibrillations. 
Now, what about time to pad placement? Is there a difference? And this becomes really important in the pre-hospital arena, in the EMS arena, right? So we've got our EMS colleagues that are going out there. And how long does it take to put these pads on when you're in the field and you've got a patient that's on the ground or, you know, in the, in the backseat of a car? So this was a really interesting study that was done in Norway. And they basically took 19 ground crew who had never had any sort of exposure or education to dual sequential uh, defibrillation. They recruited two patients, and the patients had differing BMIs, and they wanted to see, is there a difference in terms of how long it takes to get these pads on a patient who has a higher BMI relative to a lower BMI? And so they went through 216 scenarios, and they mixed and matched the ground crew so that no two people were getting overly comfortable with one another. And what they found was there is a difference. So when you put two pads on versus four pads on, it takes longer to put four pads on. Why? So they initiated CPR, and then at that first, they would get the pads on, do the rhythm check, do the defibrillation. Not in real life. These pa the, the, the patients were still alive, let's be clear. And then they tried to figure out what's the most efficient way of rolling the patient so we can get that posterior pad on. And so they were grabbing the left hip, rolling the patient towards the first paramedic while the second paramedic is slapping that second pad on the back. Roll back, resume CPR. So it takes time. So there's a 13-second difference between trying to put two pads on versus four pads on. And when you're thinking about CPR delays and our goal of being less than 10 seconds, you need to be mindful that this may introduce delays in your CPR. And then the last concept that the DOS-VF um, investigators were looking at was, is there a difference between patients that are in recurrent VFib versus refractory VFib? And what does that mean? Refractory VFib, three shocks, you never come out of VFib. At no point do you break that dysrhythmia. Recurrent VFib, at some point in those first three shocks that are being delivered, you have at least five seconds that is not VFib, okay? And is there a difference between patients that are able to terminate VFib even for just five seconds? Do they do better and which strategy works better for them as compared to patients who are just in VFib the entire time? And so what did we find here? So in patients that are in refractory VFib, so at no point does that VFib break, you can see survival to discharge and survival with good neurologic outcome, big goose egg with standard defibrillation, okay? And so it trends toward that dual sequential external defibrillation. And then with recurrent VFib, so if there's even a whisper that this patient is breaking their VFib at some point in those first three standard shocks, you can see they tend to do better overall, whether you're doing standard vector change or the dual sequential external defibrillation, but again, starts trending towards that dual sequential external defibrillation. So a couple of things to keep in mind. Like begets like. So if you are you, whatever model defibrillator you are using, the second one, if you're going to do dual sequential external defibrillation, keep them the same. You're, we're not mixing and matching uh, makes and models here. So the exact same defibrillator front and back. Two, Pads should not touch. So no touching. You want to make sure you spread them out as much as you can. Again, some of these patients are not going to have a whole lot of body surface area, and you're going to have to do your best to spread them out so they don't touch. Consider the dual sequential early uh, external defibrillation early. And so we usually say three standard shocks and then move on. But um, by the time the patients get to us in the emergency department, they've already been defibrillated multiple times by our, um, by our EMS crew. And oftentimes, vector change has already been um, instituted as well. And so if they've already tried standard and they've already tried vector change, then think about doing dual sequential when they hit the door. And then lastly, be aware that trying to get all those pads on, because oftentimes we're doing that in the emergency department, is going to cause delays in CPR. So be very mindful and keep your eye on that clock so that you're not exceeding those 10-second pauses of CPR. Thank you so much.